Who was that doughty Scotsman Thomas Reed who has come down to us known as the father of common sense philosophy? Who is this thinker who until relatively recently was largely ignored by philosophers and only in the last 10 years to be restored not only to respectability but indeed to a position, a well-earned position of philosophical eminence? Well, if the maxim publish or perish had been operative during Reed's time, it's doubtful he ever would have had an academic position. He was born in 1710, but his first publication of major consequence came out in 1764. What might today's deans and colleagues say of a 53-year-old philosopher yet to have a book to his name? Fortunately for him, and for philosophy, the Scottish Enlightenment had different standards. Indeed, by these standards, many of today's more celebrated professors might have had a better fate had they published much less or even nothing at all. Reed was known to be an exceptional person by all of his contemporaries. He did study for the ministry. He held a position in the church at Numachar for a period of years and then settled down to teach at his alma mater, Marshall College, University of Aberdeen. It wouldn't be long and even before the publication of his An Inquiry into the Human Mind, that he would be called to Glasgow to take the position recently relinquished by Adam Smith. The Scottish academic world knew his formidable powers long before the reading public would come to sample them. At Aberdeen, he was the founder of what came to be called the Wise Club, which met every fortnight, engaged, in, engaged all the major philosophical issues, wrote papers, planned longer treatises, and otherwise improved each other. A number of the productions of the Wise Club turned out to be important philosophically, but none that equaled Reed's Inquiry of 1764. I might note that it is in this work, in the section titled The Geometry of Visibles, that Reed anticipates by a half century the non-Euclidean geometry of Riemann. Reed was a master of the science of optics. On his mother's side, he's a Gregory of the famous Cambridge University family, famous in optics and mathematics. Reed, too, wrote but did not publish original work in mathematics and astronomy. His writings were widely respected in the United States, where in the years leading to and just following the founding, Scottish thought was profoundly influential. His closest friend and student, Dougal Stewart, was judged by Thomas Jefferson to be one of the two greatest metaphysicians of the age, the other being Destut Comte de Tracy in France. John Adams regarded Reed's work in philosophy of mind to be superior to that of Locke and even to Aristotle. Jefferson would also write to a nephew that if the nephew would understand what the Constitutional Convention is all about, he might read that part of Thomas Reed's inquiry on natural language. I'll return to this later. The native Scot James Wilson, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, a member of the Constitutional Convention of 1787, and later Associate Justice of the first U.S. Supreme Court, was greatly influenced by Reed's inquiry. He even cites the work in his opinion in Chisholm v. Georgia, 1793, the first major jurisdictional dispute that the Supreme Court would settle. Reed's French translator, Victor Cousin, would become an important figure in French education and would see to it that a Reedian common sense philosophy would guide French education, an influence that was still evident a century later. He was a man of extraordinary breadth and of winning character. He was a reserved and not self-promoting fellow at all. I very much agree with the Brown University philosopher Roderick Chisholm that if you're looking for a 300-page work in philosophy, absolutely luminous and clear, analytically precise, and in the English language, you probably have no other place to look than Thomas Reed's An Inquiry into the Human Mind. I discuss him here as the most successful and systematic of Hume's contemporary critics. There's a story too long to tell in its fullness about Reed writing to Hume to read the inquiry before Reed sends it to printers, just out of fairness. They had a friend in common, Hugh Blair, who passed the manuscript on to Hume, who promptly returned it, noting that clerics should devote themselves to bothering each other and should leave philosophy to philosophers. 
Unfortunately, Blair persisted, and Hume did read the work carefully, and carefully enough to realize he was in the presence of a first-rate mind. Indeed, a decade later, preparing what was to be the final edition of his own work, Hume informs his publisher that in his revisions and editions, he has answered Dr. Reed, quote, and that silly Beatty. Well, James Beatty, as I have uh, mentioned, was one who had the right position on the question of slavery. His own critique of Hume's philosophy, however, was far less respectful than was Reed's, and indeed it was less discerning as well. Well, Hume wrote a glowing letter to Reed, complaining that the only part he found obscure was the geometry of visibles. And this is revealing, for it's just that section of Reed's inquiry that challenges the very linchpin of mediational theories of perception. I'll try to cover a bit of this in, in today's lecture. Reed writes back to Hume in response to his kind letter, and I think in Reed's reply, one grasps the reasonableness and civility of Enlightenment sensibilities. Here are two philosophical disputants who really are at cross purposes in the most fundamental ways. And what does Reed write back to Hume? He writes back and says that, quote, your company would, although we are all good Christians, be more acceptable than that of St. Athanasius. If you write no more in morals, politics, or metaphysics, I am afraid we shall be at a loss for subjects." Close quote. Here is the smile of reason radi radiating over whole realms of thought. Now what about the inquiry itself and the major claims that Hume uh, had been making? First, Reed acknowledges what Hume himself says about causation and our knowledge of the external world. Hume tells us in his treatise that once he has left the privacy of his study, he thinks the way ordinary persons think. He quite understands uh, common confusions here because they're his own confusions. It was only in the solitude of his philosophical reflections that he was able to produce his philosophy, and Reed finds in this the source of Hume's confusion. First, he gently chides Hume for embracing a philosophy that is like a hobby horse which a man when he is ill can keep at home with him and ride to his contentment. But should he bring it into the marketplace, his friends will quickly impanel a jury and confiscate his estates. Reed's common sense philosophy puts a certain requirement on a philosopher, namely the willingness to live according to the terms of his own philosophy. Reed says that the only complete skeptic that philosophy has ever turned up is Pyrrho of Aaliyah, who was so doubtful about the reality of threatening and dangerous things that his friends used to have to walk around the city with him lest he march into flames or fall into rivers. But Reed says that even Pyrrho of Aaliyah is said to have chased his cook down the street with a frying pan in his hand for the awful meal he had served some of Pyrrho's guests. So even Pyrrho knew where to draw the line at Pyrrhonism. Now Reed here is just being playful. He continues in the vein when he considers Descartes' famous cogito ergo sum. He says, here we have a philosopher unwilling to accept his own existence until he can come up with a very good rational argument for it. And how fortunate for Descartes and for all of philosophy that he did. For had that argument failed, Descartes' situation and that of philosophy would have been absolutely deplorable. Reed says a man who disbelieves his own existence is no more fit to be reasoned with than one who thinks he's made of glass. Now I say this is Reed at his most playful, trying to get something quite clear in his readers and in his fellow philosophers' minds, namely that in any significant conflict between the dictates of common sense, which I will define in a moment, and the productions of the philosophical imagination, it is philosophical theorizing that finally must yield. Now what does Reed mean by a principle of common sense? He doesn't mean the wisdom of the crowd. He doesn't mean prevailing opinions or the settled ethos of a given community. He says by a principle of common sense, a term he wished he had a substitute for, by a principle of common sense he means that which we have nothing less than an obligation to take for granted in all of the ordinary affairs of life. And he, illus he illustrates the point with the, quote, lowly caterpillar that will crawl across a thousand leaves until it finds the one that's right for its diet. 
That's how a principle of, of common sense operates. One cannot begin the day, engage the business of life, except on a certain set of core principles, these being undeliberated. They're not matters of opinion or belief. They are the necessary preconditions for thought and action. At the core of Hume's epistemology is the theory that all of our knowledge is mediated, that we can never get out from behind that prism through which reality must be projected for us to know anything about it. Hume is in good company here. Reed notes the long, almost uninterrupted philosophical tradition that includes some of the most improbable soulmates, so to speak. It includes Aristotle and his theory of the phantasms. It includes Locke, of course, and most of the scholastics before Locke. It's central to Bishop Berkeley's philosophy. Now, the theory which they all subscribe to is a mediational theory of knowledge. The external world comes to be represented in some way via mediation by the senses. It cannot be directly known. Considering this theory, Reed says that if this is true, he will lay his hands across his lips and become a skeptic. Reed dubs this theory the ideal theory. We might want to call it more easily the idea theory, the theory according to which the contents of consciousness are the result of copies made of something at the level of the sense organs, so that we never know the external world directly, but only by way of ideas of the external world copies. Now, whatever the senses report is what the mind has to deal with. The mind somehow constructs podiums and persons and stars and sweet tastes out of something at the sensory level. But we can never know the relationship, however, between what the senses have done to all this data and the external world itself. Reed is as much troubled by the method philosophers have employed in reaching so worrisome a conclusion as he is by the conclusion itself. If philosophers had used the methods of Bacon and Newton, experimental methods, instead of sitting back and speculating idly in an armchair, if they actually subjected views of this kind to the sort of experimental analysis that we now know to be the right mode of inquiry, strikingly different conclusions would have been reached. The geometry of visibles illustrates such an experimental approach. Here more in the manner of a thought experiment, though one that surely could be conducted in a laboratory. The example is a subtle one, and it eluded no less a genius than Hume, so let me try to craft a very simplified summary of the argument. Imagine that the eye is positioned at the center of an indefinitely large sphere, on the surface of which you might project anything you like. Well, anything you do project onto the surface of a sphere will, of course, be spherically projected. It will map onto the sp spherical shape of the object that receives the projection. Now, if, if you were to take a right-angle triangle and thus project it, it would follow the curvature of the sphere. Reed here is reminding readers of how the external world impresses itself on the visual organ. Now, as the bottom of the eye is itself curved, any projection of light from the external world is going to take on that curvature, except in the very small region of the retina known as the fovea. If the area is so small, there will be very little discrepancy between a curved triangle and a rectilinear one. Now, suppose you draw a right angle triangle on a piece of paper. Well, here's a core question. What is it you see? Do you see the curvilinear projection that would take place optically, or do you see the triangle as that tangible triangle itself, that is, as a rectilinear triangle? You see it as a rectilinear triangle. It has none of the spherical properties that you would expect if the mind were simply making a copy of whatever is taking place at the bottom of the eye. Now, Reed notes that when the external world impinges on sense organs, it sets up an activity that physiological activity constitutes a kind of sign system, what Reed calls a natural sign. The external world creates natural consequences in our sensory biology. The mind, Reed says, by a way we do not understand, is somehow able to go from these signs, from these physiological signals, to the things signified. The essential mission of science, in general, is to work out the rules by which natural signs are connected with things signified. 
As Reed says in his chapter on touch, here praising Francis Bacon for his insights, Reed says, quote, the first class of natural signs comprehends those whose connection with the thing is signified is, is sig uh, uh, the thing signified is established by nature, but discovered only by experience. The great Lord Verulam, um, he's talking about Bacon, had a perfect comprehension of this when he called it an interpretation of nature. What is all we know of mechanics, astronomy, and optics, but connections established by nature and discovered by experience or observation? Close quote. The method of Bacon, do you see? Now, in the matter of vision, Reed came too early to know the detail of processes giving rise to our perception of objects in the external world. The first response to light, as we know, is biochemical. That is, there are changes in the pigment chemistry of retinal receptors. And as a result of these biochemical changes, patterns of electrical activity are set up in the optic nerve fibers. And these signals are then sent back into the brain so that the whole process is played out at the level of neuroelectric processing. But no one sees neuroelectric events. Rather, we see stars and persons, carpets and bulldogs. In other words, we somehow are able to extract from the natural signs the biochemical, physiological responses to stimulation, the objects that they signify. How that comes about, Reed does not pretend to know. Referring it to that, quote, mint of nature, so productive of all sorts of marvels. In a letter to Hume, Reed clarifies further the concept of natural signs. He writes, quote, this connection which na nature hath established betwixt our sensations and the conception and belief of external objects, I express two ways. Either by saying that the sensations suggest the objects by a natural principle of the mind, or by saying that the sensations are natural signs of the objects. These expressions signify one and the same thing. I do not pretend by them to account for this connection, but only to affirm it." Close quote. Just as the caterpillar knows what leaf to eat, in all other transactions there is a fitness and aptness between the constitutive principles of our biology and the demands the external world places on us. This is not an accidental arrangement. If in fact all we knew were those chimeras or whatever it is that the mind is possessed of when it goes about making copies of whatever it is in the sense organs, we couldn't get from A to B we'd have to be doubtful about there even being an external world. If I adopt the philosophy of Bishop Barclay, what's the result, asks Reed. I step into a dirty kennel. I bang my head against a signpost. And after a thousand such experiences, I come to the conclusion that there really is an external material world, and I'm located in it, and I better remain mindful of the fact. So Reed rejects the so-called copy theory, according to which the mind somehow makes copies of what the senses report. Indeed, the only sense modality in which such a theory is even intelligible is vision, and the geometry of visible shows that it fails there. If the ideal theory doesn't work in vision, it surely will not work anywhere else. More to the point, however, Reed's analysis of the problem in this manner is intended to convey an experimental approach of the Baconian-Newtonian variety in opposition to the arrant theorizing to which philosophers are especially prone, he believes. I should note here that in Reed's published and unpublished works, there is ample evidence of his own actual experiments in visual perception, and he encourages others to do likewise, using arguments and demonstrations that in many respects anticipate the field of experimental psychology and the experimental psychology of perception. Now what about the concept of causation? Hume's constant conjunction being the basis upon which we make causal ascriptions. Reed rejects this out of hand. No two events have been as constantly conjoined as day and night, says Reed, and yet no one regards day to be the cause of night or night to be the cause of day. There are any number of constantly conjoined events which we know are mere correlations. You know more than that. One need not repeat an action to discover himself to be its cause. Very often, we sort of habitually attribute causation, where if we knew better and thought more clearly about it, we'd withhold such ascriptions. But the concept of causation set forth by Hume 
Reed believes, is entirely unsatisfactory. Reed considers the process from the percipient's perspective and concludes that no set of observations or events taking place in the external world could possibly lead to a concept like A causes B. There would just be repetitive sequences. On Reed's understanding, the concept of causation actually is an inference we make based on our own immediate knowledge of ourselves as having agentic or active power, that is, from a knowledge of ourselves as having an active power to do something or to forbear from doing something, knowing that, we then attribute comparable powers to events in the external world. Our knowledge of our own active power, says Reed, must begin very early in life. Consider only the point at which an infant knows the difference between sucking his own thumb and having something else in his mouth. The point at which one recognizes that one is able to bring things about. I can darken the world simply by closing my eyes, do you see? Now, since we recognize ourselves as having the power to bring about such things, the inference we then make when we see things being brought about in the external world is that there must be some kindred kind of power that's bringing these events about also. So we see that Reed actually turns the tables on Hume. Reed begins with an understanding of ourselves as having active powers being the basis upon which we then might make causal attributions in the external natural world. And he concludes that absent these active powers, the concept of causation never could be formed in the first instance. So Reed's analysis is comparably psychological, comparable to Hume's, as it were. But it is leading very much in the direction of moral autonomy as the necessary precondition for the Humean operation to take place at all. In a word, for there to be Humean modes of causal concepts, there must be Reedian active powers. Now what about Hume's moral theory, which would have passion rule reason and sentiment uh, establish all moral content? Reed is satisfied that even the committed hedonist can't possibly defend that position. Take the committed hedonist setting out to do nothing but maximize pleasure, maximize utility. Reed is not accepting that any such being outside the realm of pathology has actually ever existed. But suppose you had an entity of that sort. That entity would have to have the full rational powers and resources that Hume seems to be skeptical about. People will take foul-tasting medicine in the judgment that it will have long-term salutary consequences. And this is only possible to a rational calculating being, able to anticipate long-range consequences, and able to commit himself to a course of action likely to produce what is good on the whole over the long run. So it isn't enough to say that we are pleasure-seeking, pain-avoiding organisms, as if that settled the matter. Given human history, and the inclinations of human beings, and the needs and purposes that we identify, we have to be, and are, rational entities first, even at the level of rational calculations as to what is in our long-range interest. A philosopher should look for evidence to determine whether a theoretical position is sound or not. That's Reed's emphasis. What we know about human history affords ample evidence of an essentially altruistic disposition in human beings. There is no question that the lives of saints and heroes alone make clear our capacity for bona fide self-sacrifice, not in the interest of utility, but in the interest of what Reed refers to, here in anticipation of Kant, by the way, what Reed refers to as the first principles of morals. Just as there are preconditions for us to be knowledgeable about the world, there must be active powers for us to have the concept of causation, and there must also be a set of dispositions of an essentially moral nature. They can't come from outside. They have to be there to match up with events in the external world. Nor can they be mere passions or emotions, because passions and emotions as such are not principled. They're simply states of sentiment or states of feeling. Now, Reed offers not a rational theory of morality, but a psychological theory. No one would deliberate at a choice point except in the belief that he had the power to execute one or another course of action.
No one would hold himself or others responsible for actions, except in the belief that others and oneself had the power to do otherwise. Nor would one even make plans except in the belief that these were at least within the realm of personal power to bring to fruition. The belief that our actions are in our power is, for Reed, another gift from the mint of nature, and is more basic than the rational artifices that might be used to criticize it. Reed must also counter forms of conventionalism that would reduce moral and epistemic claims to little more than verbal customs or uncritical, uncritical modes of discourse. Locke and Hume both subscribed to a conventionalist theory of meaning, firmly opposed by Reed. As Reed noted, for words to take on a conventional meaning, there must be in place some means by which to signal agreement and enter into compacts and understandings. But this itself requires a language. Now, Reed argues that for there to be an artificial language, like English, French, German, etc., such as the, one I, the language I'm using now, it must be grounded in what initially is a natural language, a language of facial expression, intonation, posture, invitations to cooperate, signs of fear. He finds these throughout the animal kingdom, and he reasons that artificial languages are grafted onto these natural behaviors, which allow us to have a shared kind of life with each other, and indeed with other creatures of nature. Finally, let's consider Reed's approach to the question or the problem of personal identity. Hume's account was an improvement on Locke. Locke's theory of personal identity was reducible to a kind of uh, storage of experiences. Reed finds this entirely weak, and, uh, and uh, it, it invited the happy wrath of the scriblarians. On Locke's account, there's still some sort of observer of consciousness knitting together experiences that provide, an, in the ensemble, one's identity. Hume's account actually eliminates the middleman. Personal identity just is the train of associated or bundled perceptions. It's like a parade formation. If you take the elements of memory and the elements of consciousness as entities in a parade, well, some can be replaced by others as marching soldiers might be replaced, but the parade formation remains continuous over time. That's Hume's approach. Now, Reed concludes, this whole approach to personal identity is actually a non-starter. Locke's theory, he says, founders. For someone to recall having done something does not make him the person who did it. If you remembered losing the Battle of Waterloo, it would not make you Napoleon. Moreover, it fails at the level of logic. If you want to say that personal identity is just a collection of memories, then consider this. And Reed here borrows a page from Barclay's Alciphron. Imagine a brave officer, decorated for valor in battle, who recalls having been the young boy once punished for stealing apples from the orchard. Call the brave officer B, and call the young boy A. Now imagine an aging general who recalls having been the brave officer decorated for battle, but has no recollection whatever of the young boy once punished for stealing fruit from the orchard, and call the aging general C. Now on Locke's account, A equals B, and B equals C, but A doesn't equal C. So the logical property of transitivity is violated, and the identity statement simply fails. Hume's account is more subtle, but Reed has already offered a compelling critique of Hume's concept of causation, and this is at the foundation of Hume's theory of personal identity. For the parade formation to be held together, it must be by that Humean causal chain forged out of constant conjunctions. Reed has argued that this can't work, so in any case, if it can't work, the theory of personal identity tethered to it can't work. No, for there to be treason, there must be a traitor, says Reed. And when Hume says that when he looks for himself, he finds nothing but a bundle of perceptions, Reed wants to remind Hume that it's Hume who's doing the looking. In the introduction to his inquiry, Reed summarized his position with customary clarity, putting on notice those philosophers who might prefer the comfortable cushion of subtle speculation to the hard pavement that leads to small but cumulative understanding. He put it this way, framing it as a Presbyterian cleric, but advancing a thesis whose force remains even with the theology removed. Quote, Conjectures and theories are the creatures of men, and will always be found unlike the creatures of God. 
If we would know the works of God, we must consult themselves with attention and humility, without daring to add anything of ours to what they declare. A just interpretation of nature is the only sound and orthodox philosophy. Whatever we add of our own is apocryphal and of no authority. Thank you, Thomas Reed.